So Dr. Kristen Lear has over 15 years of experience protecting bats and sharing her passion with the public. She got her start in bat conservation at age 12 when she built and installed bat, bat houses for her Girl Scout. Uh, this is her silver award project. I'm an Eagle Scout, so scouting is uh, in our past. Uh, you've led research and conservation around the world, and I can't wait to talk about you with that. those things. And you've been on other broadcasts, National Geographic, Mission Unstoppable or CBS, and, and now here on Science Streams. So this is the Thank best one so me. far. Yeah. Thank you for I being agree. here. Uh, you have a BA in zoology from Ohio Wesleyan University and a PhD in integrative conservation from the University of Georgia. Yep. And what are you doing now? Good question. Uh, I work at Bat Conservation International. So we're a nonprofit that works around the world to study bats and uh, protect them. So it's, it's honestly like a dream job. I started about a year ago um, and have been absolutely loving it um, and doing the work. Uh, I work in Mexico and the US Southwest to protect pollinating bats through our agave restoration initiative. So it's a uh, pretty hands-on work normally, although much more office recently. I have some questions about that, about the uh, agave yeah, research. Yep. Um, but before we get there, tell us about this evolving passion with bats. I mean, you wear bats on your sleeve, literally. It yes. is <laughs> like your embodiment of who you are. Um, was it just like a switch that went off when you were 12? You're just like, I can do this for a living. I love bats. Yeah, I mean, it kind of was like, I, I've always been drawn to the underdog. Um, I just remember like growing up, even when I was really little and we'd be watching like football on TV and I would always ask like, who, who was the team that wasn't, you know, the, the big team. And I would always root for the, that team, the, the underdog. Um, and so I think that kind of carried on into, into animals. Um, I've always really liked snakes and spiders and rats. I had pet rats growing up, um, you know, so those kind of like creepy crawlies that are kind of get a bad rap. Um, I've always been really drawn to them and bats definitely fall into that category of the kind of the misunderstood animals um, that need our help. So yeah, it was kind of a natural thing, you know, in sixth grade doing my Girl Scout Silver Award project. Like how can I help an animal that really gets a bad rap, went to bats, and honestly, um, they're just so cool. And so finding out that you can have a career working with bats, I was hooked from then on. That's awesome. Now we talked about family earlier. Mm -hmm. Did you ever bring anything home like a pet and your family was like, we got to draw the line, Kristen. Spiders? Were... <laughs> no, no. I got enough in the basement. We don't need you bringing them in. Yeah. Get that out of the house. Yes. Well, not, not so much, actually, because my, my parents were very supportive. Um, you know, they were always encouraging me to, like, go out and find things in the ground. And, like, I gardened with my grandma uh, growing up, and she would, like, pick up the worms and, like, give me the worms to look at. Um, so I think I, I'm sure, like, other families wouldn't really do that all the time. But for me, it was kind of a normal thing to do. Um, I think the pet rats though, that was the, that was almost like a line drawn, um, in, in elementary school. when I went home and asked if I could get pet rats, my parents were like, mm. but they let me and, and they were great. They're great pets. So I worked out. I've heard that rats are good pets. They are. They're fantastic. They're like little dogs. <laughs> <laughs> what other pets have you had? Mostly the, the normal cats oh, okay. and dogs. I grew up with cats. Um, never had any like snakes or anything like that. I was really hooked on the rats. Like I had many, many rats throughout my like middle school and high school. Um, I actually got one from the pet store that was uh, pregnant at the time that I got her. And um, 
yeah, my my mom was like, are you sure she's not pregnant? And I was like, oh, no, she's just fat. But I, I kind of suspected that she was pregnant, and we brought her home, and sure enough, she had a little baby. So she had 12 babies. So we had 14 rats at one time. That was pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> Carla Khan asks, why rats? Because you like the creepy crawly. I do. And I mean, they're cute. Like, I, I know most people don't s- see that. But I mean, they're, they're really smart. You can like train them to do tricks and like run mazes and like train them, litter box train them. I never did any of that stuff because I was like, you know, a kid. <laughs> but um, but they're, I just, I've always thought they were really cute. I don't know why. I don't know. <laughs> Let's get to the bats and yep. your research in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, wait, we have, a, we have a question from the audience. Volcano Doc. What do you find is the public's biggest misconception about bats? Great question. I think the biggest misconception is that bats are bad and that we don't want to have them around. Um, uh, I, I just see that in so many different ways working in bat conservation. Um, you know, people, if they get them inside their attic or by their house, sometimes get nervous having bats around. But there really is no reason to fear them. Um, and they actually are really beneficial. You know, they eat a lot of insects, things like agricultural pests and mosquitoes. Um, so they're really great to have around. But I think countering that kind of, I think it's an innate fear sometimes when, you know, like when I see a cockroach, that's like the one thing that kind of creeps me out. And I, I can't explain it, why I react that way. It's just a visceral reaction. I think sometimes people have that with bats. So, um you know, trying to counter that is, is part of what I do. Um, do you find it's a misconception that people think bats are rodents? Yes, yes, definitely. So I know this is changing, but, you know, first we get the, the bats are birds misconception um, because they can fly, but, um, you know, bats are mammals. They have hair and and. Um, you know, give birth to live young that they feed with milk. So they're just like us. Um, but then the next kind of step to that is, yes, people think that they are like flying rodents um, or rats with wings, but they're actually more closely related to, to humans evolutionarily than they are to rodents, which is kind of mind blowing. Like I, I'm not an evolutionary like biologist, so I don't, I'm not up with all of that, but it, it is crazy how that works out. Like they're more closely related to primates than rodents. Yeah, yeah, that's so crazy. bizarre. It is. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. You're more yep. closely related to a bat than a rodent. Everyone learned something. Yay! <laughs> Take note. <laughs> Very good. Now, speaking of bats and eating insects and pollination mm-hmm. in Mexico, if there were no bats, would there still be tequila? Oh, that's a loaded question. So no is in a nutshell, but kind of yes now. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So bats pollinate agaves. Um, There are nectar feeding bats that, you know, drink the nectar from the agave flowers, just like hummingbirds or bees or moths do. And they pollinate the plants and help the plants reproduce. So historically and evolutionarily, bats and agaves co-evolved together um, and without bats, we wouldn't have agaves. But with the current like tequila industry, it's it's very industrialized, um, you know, like a lot of big crops and big agriculture is. And so harvesters actually cut and use there's little um, clones that grow out the side of agaves, out the base of the agave, that are genetically identical to the mother plant. So the farmers will take those little baby agaves and transplant them in their fields to continue growing the biggest and the best agaves. So the bats are really no longer involved in that relationship anymore because they don't let the agaves flower. The bats um, don't have any food. So it's kind of a crazy system. We wouldn't have the agaves historically without the bats, but we've kind of cut those, you know, that food supply off for the bats through that industry. Okay. Yeah. That kind of 
makes sense. I mean, that's similar to a lot of things I've heard in agriculture. Yeah. Where a lot of it becomes cut off because you're just using vegetative propagation. Right. And you've bred in the ability to not need a pollinator because you want mm -hmm. that pure line. Right. Yeah. And, and with tequila, like that is the case, but mezcal, if you've ever had mezcal, it's a, it's kind of like rectangles and squares. All tequila is mezcal, but not all mezcal is tequila. Um, and mezcal can be made from wild agaves. Um, they can be made from a lot of more varieties of agaves. And so in that system, bats are still very important pollinators um, in the mezcal kind of system. So if you like mezcal, you definitely want to keep the bats around. Okay. That was on my list of questions. Oh, cool. Answered. Good. <laughs> and if anyone has any other questions, just throw it out there. Yeah, bats are really important. Uh, like what other, like agriculture do we need bats for? So close to home. So um, I'm in the U.S., obviously, but we have uh, cotton crops corn crops and pecan crops, all of which are protected by bats. Um, they're not pollinated by bats, but the insectivorous bats that eat insects um, consume those agricultural pests like the corn earworm moth, uh, the pecan nut case bearer moth. So there are these, these insects that damage those crops and the bats are helping keep those uh, insect populations under control. So again, um, it's a very, very strong benefit of having bats around. Things like for pollination, things like uh, bananas and mangoes, uh, chocolate, you know, cacao plants, all of those are pollinated by bats. So, you know, I, I think it'd be a really sad world without chocolate. So I definitely thank the bats for, for bringing us chocolate. What about coffee? Yeah. So again, the coffee plantations with the bats eating the, the pest insects and pollinating around. Yep. Again, bats are helping. So coffee, tequila chocolate i mean what else do you need <laughs> so if suddenly bats weren't around as carla khan asked mm -hmm. things would be bad yeah exactly so there's been studies done that um will exclude bats from a like a crop of corn for example and what they've seen happen is that there's a lot more damage to the plants without the bats being able to to eat the insects around um, and they also um, it's not just eating the insects the mere presence of bats can reduce the pest insect activity. Um, they're not flying around as much because they're kind of afraid of getting eaten by the bats. And so um, it, it reduces the amount of damage to the crops. Um, so I don't think our crops would disappear, but we'd probably be paying a lot higher prices for you know things like corn, cotton, uh, pecans at the grocery store. And farmers would have to use a lot more pesticides, which again, isn't good for us or the environment. Yes, make a little more. It's an interview day <laughs> or evening. <laughs> yes, yeah, I got now let's some good talk questions about. Going on. Go, go ahead. I said you got some good questions. Folks yep. are asking great questions. This summer, I was out with my family at a dude ranch, and it was evening. And we're at a volleyball, uh, like outdoor volleyball place. We're hitting the volleyball around because my youngest loves playing volleyball. And it got to be evening and there's like forests all around us. Um, and we're in this field and we look up and, you know, there were bats, of course. Right. Yes. We're like, oh, look at those cool bats. And there's also some some birds, some, you know, flying around the evening birds. And I look way up and I see a bat way up high. And yeah. I just thought to my, I'm like, I don't remember ever seeing a bat that high up in the air. I'm always think of seeing them going from like tree to tree kind of lower, but you know, you could see them up there, you know, and there were birds up there mm -hmm. too. So obviously there were, there was prey up there. So right. I was wondering how common it is for, and this is my own curiosity. Maybe other people have wondered this, you know, mm -hmm. how far up have bats flown? Uh, and is that type of thing? Sometimes they do it migratory or is it also predatory? Because I thought that was amazing that they would be that high. 
Yeah, that's a really great question. So I think most of the bats that we, yeah, like we see in our everyday lives are more around the kind of the ground ish level, the tree level, right? Mm -hmm. Cause that's where a lot of insects are, but, um, don't quote me on the actual number, but the Mexican free tailed bat, which is a really common bat in like most of the Southern and Western part of the U S um, I believe they can fly up to almost a mile high and they do that. Yes. For migrating and commuting, but um, insects also will go up really high in those kind of clouds of insects um, and travel on the winds that are, you know, that high. And so the bats kind of use it as a, like a highway to get far, very far, very fast. Um, but it's, it's crazy how they can fly, you know, that high. That's really high. Um, but they're up there and we can actually see them on, um, weather radar. If you look up like Doppler radar bats on like YouTube, you can actually see from like Texas, the bats, mm -hmm. huge clouds of bats emerging from Bracken cave in near San Antonio. And then they move and it, it looks like a rain cloud, but it's literally a cloud of bats moving across the landscape. Um, it's pretty cool. Pretty wild to see. Awesome. There's a lot of stuff in chat. Oh, awesome. Oh, I see I see some familiar faces or familiar names. Oh, awesome. awesome. <laughs> That's cool. And so Michael wants to know the connection between potential bats and viruses. Will be general, not just coronavirus, but that, yep. that connection, if you can speak to that at all. Yeah, there's a lot of research obviously going on in the world of wildlife and, um, and diseases. And so with bats, I think they're really, they're, there's still a lot of uncertainty about whether bats as a, as a whole have like carry more viruses than other groups of animals. Um, but the really key and really cool thing about bats is that they actually are able to tolerate viruses a lot better than us and many other animals, which means that they can have the virus in their bodies and not get sick. Um, and so I think that's, there's a lot of work going on. Can we learn from bats and how they can, you know, live with viruses, even some pretty like serious viruses sometimes um, that might be serious for, for us. How can they not get sick? And can we use that to boost our own immune systems or, you know, to fight off viruses even better? So, um, yeah, there's a, it's a, it's a really kind of with COVID obviously been a big, big thing in bat conservation in, in the bat world. Um, we still don't yet know where COVID the, the virus came from. Um, we may never know for sure, but I think bats really do have a lot of really great um, things to teach us about immune systems and, and diseases and fighting off those diseases. A lot of great storytelling on in the chat. Philip is good for that. Oh, I like the ads. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I think we're yeah, 21 minutes in and uh, people are going to get ads. You know, Twitch. I appreciate everyone being here despite ads. Thank you, Twitch. Uh, but uh, we're having a great conversation with Dr. Kristen Lear. Someone used the bats command. I have that bats command. No one's used it yet. <laughs> I, I made it special. <laughs> I want to see if it works. <laughs> oh, I haven't taught bat hands yet either. I'll have to do oh, bat, bat hands, hands in a minute. <laughs> Um, did you know Anna from Santa Monica? Yes. Yeah, that's I, awesome. I love people making connections. That's a, I know. Yeah. You've been and my favorite bat. Oh, that's a hard question. Favorite bats yeah. are hard. <laughs> I really like the nectar feeding bats because they have, you know, they drink nectar and um, I have a huge sweet tooth. What is the biggest bat? Oh, I love this question. So the biggest bat in the world is one of the flying fox species. Um, and it has a wingspan of up to six feet long from wingtip to wingtip. Yeah, six feet. And you know, you might think that that bat weighs a lot, but it only weighs about two to three pounds. So it's mostly kind of just wing. 
Um, and they only eat fruit, so it's not anything, you know, we have to, like, it's not like the scary movies with giant bats. They're just little, fruit, well, big fruit bats. So flying foxes are bats? That's a volcano mm -hmm. dot. Okay. Absolutely, yep. They are, they are a type of bat. They're like a group of bats that are... Um, they don't use echolocation. Many bats around the world do use echolocation in addition to their sight. Um, all bats can see, but flying foxes do not use echolocation. They just use their eyes and you know their noses to find fruit. Hmm. And, they're, and they're adorable. If you ever look up an image of a flying fox, they're so cute. Mm -hmm. um, question for you. You love bats. Have you ever snuggled a bat? <laughs> Not really. Um, you Have know, you wanted because, to snuggle a bat? Of course, of course. I really want to go. Um, there's some places in the U.S. like the Luby Bat Conservancy in Florida um, that have they have some of those flying foxes, and they're really cute, and you can actually like see them. Um, and, and I really want to go there and see them. But I have gotten to catch bats because you know, as bat scientists, we we sometimes catch bats to study them um, and let them go. And so I have gotten to like get kind of up close and, and see them um, up close, which is really cool. Here's a bat you can snuggle with. <laughs> this is oh great. My, my, my wife crocheted this bat for me just because she knew oh. we were talking about bats. And it's, it's bat adorable. Week. Oh my okay. gosh, I love it. I love it. And actually, I was just telling some um, another class today that there are no blue bats in the world. So now I can say that there is a blue bat in the world. The camera adds a little, it's a, it's a little purple blue. The camera makes it look a little bit more blue. Well, I don't think there's any purple cute. bats either. <laughs> there's not a lot of blue everything in nature. <laughs> no, no. Water, right? And sky. <laughs> <laughs> and even that's not really blue. It's just a refracted light that makes it look blue. Mm. <laughs> messes with your brain. Oh, science. <laughs> you ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. <laughs> <sighs> So, Philip, how many bat stories do you have? You slept in a cave with this scout troop all night, and someone woke up with a bat in their sleeping bag. Oh my you gosh, know, that sounds crazy. That was I mean, snuggling I, I, with a bat right there. Just don't yeah, roll over and squish say. it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the bat would be very happy if you did that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I think everyone has a bat story though. Like you know, when you say when you when you say the word bat to people, I think. Yeah, everyone like has some encounter or some like some story, which I think is really cool. It, um, I think it kind of brings people together and opens doors for conversation. Um, sometimes those experiences are negative, but you know, hopefully most of them are positive. I had a student, and speaking of bat stories, and she was always getting bats in her house. And she was like, "Oh, I got these little bats," and this is during white nose syndrome was coming out, and I'm like, "You have prime bat habitat in your attic." <laughs> You can't change that. You have to foster yep. that habitat for bats. She's like, yep. no, get them out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people, I, I totally yeah. get it. Like they poop a lot, you know, like yeah. they, they poop. you can sell that guano. It's fertilizer. You can, it is very good fertilizer. <laughs> it is kind of stinky. So I get, if you have like a thousand bats in your attic, you know, that might be a bit of a problem, but if it was a small colony. It might be okay. It's like when you have like that colony of bees in your wall. Oh, I love yes. the bees. Save the bees. Yep. But they're in my wall. <laughs> my friend actually had that. Their entire like wall was full of bees and like you could hear them. It was kind of cool. I love bees too. So I think it was cool. So onto this topic though, bat habitat. You got your start making bat boxes. There is mm -hmm. a science to this. There's yes. better bat boxes mm -hmm. than other bat boxes yes. what are the best bat boxes to buy or build <laughs> or build <laughs> <laughs> oh that's a great question um so most bats um if you see a bat house they're kind of they're different from bird houses because they're not like this kind of rectangular shape they're more flat um and they're wider and they're also open at the bottom so that the bats can like land on the bat house and crawl up into the bat house and hang. So the, there's no bottom to it. Um, and yeah, with bat houses, like the pretty much the bigger, the better. Um, 
you know, the more chambers, there's like, you build little slats like this wide inside the bat house and they kind of squeeze up in there and they like that. So the more chambers, the better, kind of the bigger and wider the house, the better, um, because it allows like more chambers, means there's different temperatures inside each chamber. Like if the sun's hitting the house on this side, that side of the bat house will be hotter and the chambers on this side will be cooler. And so the bats can actually move around between chambers if, if one gets too hot or too cold. Um, and then like placement is really important. So where you actually put up the bat house is just as important. Um, you want to, for the most part, they like to have a lot of sun. So the general recommendation is about six hours of direct sunlight per day, um, if possible. And you don't wanna put the bat house anywhere like in cluttered areas. Like you wouldn't wanna put it on a tree uh, because that tends to be too shady. And also there's too much kind of clutter around um, for the bats to like navigate through. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really like, really kind of nuances, but there's a lot of great resources online too. So, um, you know, check out um, like Bat Conservation International. We have some information and um, there's some other great bat groups that have bat house info. Yeah, and I've heard that like for the, the bat, the bat boxes and bat houses, it's actually good to put it on like, not just like a south facing, but also different sides because they love to change temperatures. Exactly. You know? And so they want to be, if they get, oh, I'm too hot. I want to be cooler now. You know, they have another yep. place to go. So they're just not, I don't like living here. And they just leave. Exactly. And also, I mean, it, it makes sense like us, you know, like, you know, my basement's a lot cooler than my upstairs. So if it's hot, I go downstairs, right? It's the same thing with us. Um, and having multiple bat houses in an area, it's kind of like a, a community of bat houses. So that, yeah, if one of them gets really too hot, they can move and not overheat. Um, so it, yeah, that community idea of like an apartment building, multiple buildings of bat houses. Yep. yep. Or multiple, multiple rooms in a house, like you said, like, I don't like exactly. the temperature in this room. I want to go to this other room. Exactly. You know, so they can have this little community where they all go. Now, yep. if you have multiple species in an area, would mm -hmm. one species tend to be in one box versus another? Cause they like Good different question. temperatures. Good question. So yes, they do have different preferences. Um, also male bats versus female bats have different preferences, even of the same species. So female bats tend to prefer warmer roosts, um, especially if they're pregnant. So do humans. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's, it's all kind of the same. <laughs> Yeah, so like having those different options is good. Um, and also different different bat species like different types of bat houses. There are, you know, different like styles and shapes of bat houses. Um, there's a really cool type of bat house called a rocket box. Um, it's more cylindrical and it's kind of really tall and it's built around a pole. And so the bats can kind of move around in it. Um, and it looks like a rocket. But um, yeah, some species tend to prefer those versus the standard kind of flat house. Um, so yeah, if you put up multiple types of houses, you're more likely to provide habitat for different species. Now we did have a question a while ago about white nose syndrome. I don't know mm -hmm. if you saw that. We can get into not. that now. Um, awesome. So yeah. tell us about it. It's um, so white nose syndrome, unfortunately, is a very bad disease that affects bats here in North America. It doesn't affect people, so we, we can't um, get sick from, it's a fungus. But what's happened is that in 2006, um, there was this one cave in New York State where um, some cavers or researchers found some bats inside the cave with this really funny like white fungus on their noses and their wings and their like skin. And it turns out that it is a fungus and it kind of eats away and irritates the skin while the bats are in hibernation during the winter. And it, I, I kind of think of it like it might be like poison ivy, like it starts really irritating. So the bat wakes up from hibernation and then it you know, gets really hungry, its metabolism is revved up. So it flies outside the cave in the middle dead of winter in places like New York where there's feet of snow and there's no insects to eat and it's freezing cold. So they either starve to death or they freeze to death. 
And um, since 2006, it's killed well, well over six million bats. But that's a that's an old estimate. So millions and millions of bats have been killed by this fungus. Um, and it's an invasive fungus. We think that came from uh, Europe or Asia, brought over by a person on somebody's probably clothes or you know gear um, to that one cave. And since then, it's spread all across the U.S. It's in Canada now. Um, it's all the way in California and the West Coast, so it's it's really bad. Um, but there's a lot of research going into how we can like treat the fungus, um, how we can help bats recover from it. So there is hope. Good. I like hope. Yes. There's so much doom and gloom these days. There is. It's good to, to, to have some hope. And, and I always have that hope. And like I said, I'm, you're outside and you do see the bats and you're like, yay. And it's not in the middle of winter. Right. Um, you'd be hopeful and be like, ah, oh, thank goodness. There's still bats around. Yes. Um, it, yeah, white nose is a pandemic for bats. It really is. It really is. It's sad. Yep. Yep. Um, and thank you, New York, for making that discovery white nose syndrome. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. It was like a shock. I was still in college, I guess, when that yeah, when that hit. And so, you know, I wasn't really up on all the, the new bat research, but, you know, talking to some of the older bat researchers, they were like really scared when that came out because they didn't know what was happening to all these bats. It can kill up to 99% of a colony in a cave. So like they were freaking out. Um, you can imagine how hard that was for people to see. Mm -hmm. And is there anything that we can do to help with white nose syndrome? And it seems like other than, you know, making, you know, houses for bats and making yeah. increasing habitat, there's not much we can do. No, I mean, I think, yeah, the main thing is supporting natural bat habitat, like even during the summer, keeping, you know, dead trees in your yard if you can, um, you know, because it's really hard when bats that are affected by white nose, when they come out of hibernation, they might be really like tattered from the fungus. So if they can get a good habitat in the spring and summer, it's more likely that they'll survive. Um, you can plant bat gardens if you have a garden. Um, you can plant night blooming flowers that attract nocturnal insects that you know our bats can eat. Um, so again, it kind of helps provide some food in times of need. Um, but yeah, I think if you go caving, obviously that's, um, there's like protocols now for disinfecting your clothes, like literally boiling your clothes or using um, you know, certain chemicals to, to wash them um, and your gear. So obviously that's uh, a big thing if you do go caving. Yeah, so Philip was talking about how they closed a cave near him so they wouldn't yep. spread it. Yeah, and some of those caves are still closed. I mean, we it, it's, it's spread by bats, obviously from bat to bat, but it's a lot of those big jumps we think are caused by people, you know, bringing it into another cave on their clothes or their gear, so trying to do the best we can to stop that spread. I was reminded of an interesting bat environmental cave story. Ooh. So there north of us is the Adirondack mountains and it was a long, uh, a mining area, um, you know, back in industrial times and they would, and now these mines are unused and they're, a lot of them are full of bats, right? Yes. The bat habitat, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. but now some, an entrepreneur decided, you know, we can fill up one of these caves that's at a higher elevation with water. And then that water can get pumped down to a lower cave and provide hydroelectric power. And then, you know, you, you repeat it. Right. Yes. Um, right. and so, you know, the, the thing is like, well, it's a, an environmental benefit, but at the same time, they're worried that there could be a potential you know, interference with the bat population. So it's one of those environmental things where us, us nature lovers are like, oh, it's green energy, but it might affect the bats. I'm confused. Right. <laughs> it is confusing. Like, I just thought I'd relay that story. <laughs> wind energy, honestly, like wind energy yeah. is the same mm -hmm. way. Like, you know, it, it's great in some circumstances, but, you know, wind turbines, you know, the big blades hit and kill many, 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 many bats and birds, um, you know, when, when they're migrating and it's, 
there are some bats now that are like on the brink of being listed on the endangered species list in the US because of wind energy. So it's, you know, you gotta, you have to pick your battles and it's, you know, it's hard. But there are ways to mitigate that. So I will say again, and there is hope to be able to have wind energy, but not, you know, not kill that many bats. Hmm. Hi, Nick. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, but what are ways you can mitigate wind energy's effect on bats, though? I mean, how do you keep a bat from running into a giant blade? That's a great question, because the bats seem to be, I don't want to say attracted to the blades, but bats are very curious animals. So sometimes, you know, if you put this giant, what looks like a huge tree in their flight pathway, they might be like, what's that? And go investigate and get whacked by it. Um, or have barotrauma, which is the pressure change in the blade area, and they get like internal damage from that, which is crazy. Um, but the way to mitigate is curtailment, which is basically um, not starting the wind turbine blades from spinning until the wind speed is at like a slightly higher wind speed. Um, because it's most of the bat fatalities happen at the low wind speeds. And the wind energy companies don't get as much energy production at low wind speeds. So if you say, hey, we, we won't start the turbine spinning until five miles per hour or greater, you can reduce a lot of those bat fatalities. Um, and the wind energy companies lose just a small fraction of the energy produced. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of work trying to work with the companies to, to adopt those policies. There is hope. There is hope. <laughs> there is hope. Yep. Volcano asks us, are we sure bats aren't cats with wings? <laughs> I don't know. I always, I wonder that, especially around Halloween, when you see everyone's like black cat pictures with their little wings on, you know, for Halloween, they look very much like, uh, like bats. <laughs> it's a great question. Another question. Mm -hmm. Doctor, what do you think about Batman and how he affects public perception of bats? I love this question. <laughs> As a message, like bats are frightening. He is a boon because he, he keeps bats in popular culture, or is he so removed from bats that it doesn't make a difference? <laughs> <laughs> I love this question because I love the Batman movies. I grew up, well, I had like the, what was it, the George Clooney ones. Um, when I was a kid, but you know, the Christian Bale ones, I love those. Um, but I do have a bone to pick with Batman because you're right that he became Batman because of his fear of bats, right? He had that scary incident in the well with the bats swirling around and he was afraid. And then he eventually like embraced that fear and became Batman. Um, but he wouldn't be Batman without that fear. Of bats and so yes it, it i think it in a way it's brought bats into like the popular culture but it still kind of perpetuates that negative dark scary myth that always almost always surrounds bats in movies and tv right we always see them in those scary situations so yeah uh, maybe someday there will be a, a positive you know bat story on in a movie Now, of course, the end or the uh, discussion about the Batman movies and their various merits. <laughs> That's true. I haven't seen many of the actual, like, the old ones, I will say. I need to get caught up on my Batman movies, but um, I like the Christian Bale ones. Well, he liked bats after he got to know bats, as everyone will. Exactly. Right. That is true. Right. Yeah. Right. He realized like all the technological advances, like echolocation and his like radar thing and the wings, like we can learn so much from bats. So that is definitely a positive about Batman. <laughs> I won't completely like, golly. oh my God, that was, that movie was so <laughs> creepy. I think I still have nightmares about that movie sometimes. <laughs> that, that was a, like a, a middle school science teacher favorite for a while. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. That's right. I forgot about that. But yeah, that bat, that bat was positive, but it wasn't he like kind of like loopy or something like. He, he was like the goofy one in the whole group. Right. Yeah. But I guess that's good. That's a good positive portrayal of a bat. Yeah. 
your fear of dogs and then you got a dog yeah my dad had a saint my dad had a fear of dogs because he was attacked as a kid and now Aww. he got to know dogs because i have dogs yep. and now he likes dogs awesome yep i think honestly like i think that's what part of the best part about being a bat scientist and bat conservationist is is like I know this sounds corny, but bringing bats out of the darkness into the light, right? Like, because we can't see them. They're they're out at night and they're very mysterious. But if we can like have these positive experiences doing like bat walks in the evening with like these acoustic detectors that you plug into your smartphone, mm -hmm. you can pick up their echolocation. Like That's it just cool. brings bats closer to people, I think, and, and really makes those positive experiences happen. And who doesn't cheer for bats at night, right? You're outside and you're like, yeah. go bats, go get those mosquitoes. Come on, exactly. eat them, eat, eat them. All right, and everyone's yep. cheering them on. Yep. <laughs> Wasn't there that football game with, um, I forget who it was, what teams were playing, but there was there were two Eastern red bats that were mating and they fell to the ground in the middle of the football field, like on national television. <laughs> and they, yeah, and people were like, oh my God. But, you know, they flew off. It was fine. <laughs> Let's go. What other questions you guys got about bats? I, I, I have a bunch. I haven't gone through all of them yet. But, um. Lots of good stuff. Okay, since no one else is asking them. What are some good bat charities or conservation groups that people could uh, get involved with? Well, I have, I have to put a plug in for the organization that I work at, Bat Conservation International. Um, you know, we, we do research around the world. We do uh, conservation work to prevent bat extinction. So, um, and we also do bat walk programs, like I was saying, getting you know, up close and personal um, to educate folks about bats. So definitely Bat Conservation International. Um, but there's so many others. Actually, right now is Bat Week, all week up through uh, Halloween, and it happens every year. And so there's a website called batweek.org um, that has a ton of great bat resources, um, arts and crafts and kids activities about bats and information on how you can help bats. Uh, so definitely check that website out. Um, it's a fantastic resource. Um, but honestly, just Google like bat conservation organization and you'll find quite a few um, that you can support and you know obviously we're always conservation we always are in need of, of support um, so any support you have is fantastic awesome now some good questions there rabies mm -hmm. Kristen wants to know about rabies and its relation to bats because a lot of people fear rabies and bats is that a real fear I mean, it is a real fear in the fact that people, you know, fear that. But yeah. um, I, I see her, her question or the question about um, thinking it's less of a problem than people think. I agree with that. Um, so rabies happens um, in less than one half of one percent of wild bats um, actually have carry it. Um, that's an estimate, of course, but you know, it's a very low percentage. Um, the problem is that when you find a, a bat on the ground or if you find any wild animal that's you know, on the ground, maybe acting a little funny, um, it, it could be sick or injured. And so you, know, you definitely don't want to like handle any wild animals, um, bats included. Um, but yeah, in general, bats is, um, sorry, root rabies is super rare. Um, I forget how many cases there are per year, but it's, I mean, you're more likely to be struck by lightning um, it's just very low, but it is very serious, right? It's a very serious disease if you do get it. So, um, that's why, you know, if you're ever in contact with a bat, um, or like a raccoon or a fox or a dog that's acting funny, um, doctors will tell you to like get your, um, the rabies shots because you don't want to take any risks, but, but it is very rare. Mm -hmm. Good question. Volcano doc wants to know. Is there anywhere in the U.S. bats do not live or in the world, I would say? Yeah. So in the U.S., no. I mean, um, Alaska has five species of bats. So there's even bats, you know, up pretty far north. Hawaii has one bat species. Um, and then mainland, obviously, has a lot of, a lot of bat species. We have 45. 
in the US and, and Canada together. Um, but in the world, Antarctica is the only continent in the world that does not have bats. So pretty yeah. much everywhere else though. I know, right? It is pretty far. I don't know if the bats could like fly there. It's pretty darn cold. And I don't know if there's insects to eat. Very Once much. it gets warm enough. Oh, that's true. Don't say that. It's depressing. <laughs> no, you could be right. No. I'm going to let you read uh, quickly us uh, in, his, in the in that slight okay, research essay there. And thanks for being here, uh, Quiglius. Appreciate your visit. Oh, okay. So, so the, okay, I see the question about um, rail, uh, railways and trains impacting bat habitat. Um, and a UK study showing how trains that are passing by significantly disrupt two bat species um, when they're running at night. And yeah, um, that's a great question like in terms of noise pollution um, noise pollution in general from like cars and, and trains and just being like in the cities um, is, a, is a big problem for birds and bats um, you know with bat echolocation they're they're literally navigating at night with sound like I said they all can see but at night you know it's harder to see um, and so if there's like big train blasts all the time all around you it it could definitely interfere with their echolocation um, and make it harder for them to navigate around. So yeah, definitely I could see how railways could impact bats um, and lights, you know, light pollution is another thing that we see with birds and with bats um, getting kind of disoriented with too much light um, having an impact. And with insects too, with the light pollution. Yeah. And if it affects yep. the insects, it'll probably affect the bats. Right. I'm just guessing and here. <laughs> yeah, and it's really interesting because it's not, it's not like all bats are affected in the same way by things like light. Um, you know, some bats actually deal pretty well with light pollution, um, like the bigger bats that are more able to fly in open areas. They actually tend to be like attracted to streetlights. You know, you'll see the insects and the moths flying around the streetlights, and the bats can come like pick off the insects. But there's but there are other bats, like smaller bat species, that tend to be more negatively affected by things like light. So it's, yeah, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. Oh, I see we're back on ads. <laughs> For those that have been here the whole time, I think it's like every 21 minutes I have to do it. Sense. But plenty of other questions if the chat doesn't have any. I mean, ask away, everybody. Because my one question was about Antarctica and if it had bats. And I answered ah, yes. that. It doesn't. Yep. <laughs> and you've never snuggled a bat, but that's probably on your bucket list now. <laughs> it is on my bucket list. <laughs> How many bat toys or, or, or stuffed animals do you own? I can't even count. <laughs> Honestly, ever since, yeah, ever since college, like my mom every year will go um, to the Halloween stores after Halloween when everything's on sale and she'll like buy, you know, bat stuff. And obviously friends give me bat gifts. Um, I mean, I have hundreds of bat, like, plushies not that i just have them like on my bed but i use them in education and outreach so i'm not just like some crazy crazy bat lady um you're a crazy bat lady sorry i am i am but not not that crazy. wear it proud you're I wearing do, a do. bat shirt for crying out loud i took this picture actually i took this picture in texas <laughs> um so yes i have lots of bat toys and bat things to to share with others and you have them to share with others. Okay. Well, that's true. My husband's like, no more bats, but that will never happen. So <laughs> there you go. See, you have a bat. <laughs> so back, I guess, make a little more fast a question. How do you feel about efforts to get rid of mosquitoes? On the one hand, mosquitoes are horrible vectors. On the other hand, bat food. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're never going to obviously get rid of all mosquitoes They're They are a natural part of the environment and, you know, we shouldn't get rid of all of them. Um, so yeah, I definitely don't think we should. 
I think the, the thing with the vectors is that some of the mosquito species are more um, more of vector species for diseases than other mosquitoes. So um, I think those efforts are targeting more of those vector species. Um, but yeah, we definitely can't, can't and probably shouldn't get rid of mosquitoes completely. I don't like mosquitoes. I don't either. They love me though, and I don't appreciate it. You have to deal with those a lot doing research in the field, I bet. Oh yes, and I Remember that one we, bats over I, here. On. Yeah, and I'm that one person. Like you'll be in a group of ten people, and they'll all all the mosquitoes will be coming to me, and and I have like repellent on. I don't I don't understand. Ugh. Other questions. Uh, Daily science. Kristen asks, are bats true hibernators? Mm -hmm. They are. Not all bats hibernate, but for the ones that do, yes, they um, they go into full hibernation um, in the deep of winter. Um, they can also go into torpor. Um, it, it's a little more complicated, but it's kind of like a less intense version of hibernation in a way. Um, but yep, they definitely can go into full hibernation. And what colors can bats be? What colors? Nine two four wants to know. Oh, colors. I love that. Not blue. Well, like I said, there's, there's no blue or purple bats, but they, I mean, the mo the majority of bats are like your standard kind of brown, like dark brown, light brown, black. Um, that's kind of like the standard, but gosh, there's so many bats. Like there's black and white bats that have black and white spots here in the U.S. that are called spotted bats, and they look like a cow with their big spots. There's... Um, there's red bats that we have here in the U.S. that are like bright, like they're more orange, but they're called red bats, bright orange. There's the painted bat um, that's super black and super orange and like gorgeous. Um, I mean, there's so many different colors of bats. There's yellow bats. Um, yeah, lots of colors. No green bats, though. A bunch of other questions. So. Um, do bats have, or do any sort of weird mating dance like some other animals? That's from Volcano Doc. Yes. Yes. Um, that's a fun question because, um, there are some bat species in the world that have some really like crazy mating behaviors. One of them is the hammer headed bat and the hammer headed bat, the males have a gigantic nose and these are like big bats and they have like this gigantic nose that they use to make a really loud honking sound through their nose and the, the male bats will fly along the trees where the female bats are roosting and as they're, the males are flying they'll they'll honk and the females will choose which male to mate with based on which one has the best honk uh, <laughs> it's like i really want that's also on my bucket list is to see that like hammer-headed bat mating it sounds crazy um there are some bats that are called sack winged bats and they're called sack winged bats because on the back of their wing, like kind of in their shoulder, they have a, a little hole, like a sack in the wing that sounds really gross. They use, the males will put spit and urine and poop into that sack and to make this lovely perfume, I know <laughs> that they will then, the females will like line up on the wall and the male will go up to the females and waft their wings with their sacks open and waft that perfume onto the females. And it's again, some like crazy mating uh, mechanism. Like I have no idea how that evolves, but <laughs> pretty nuts. Somehow. And that's just some of them. There's so many more, so many more. Crazy. Those are great stories. Uh, Raiders, you came in at the right time for that story. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, oh my, yeah. the, the wafting of the sacks full of, I don't even want to go into that. If I did that, I'd get arrested. If mm -hmm. bat does that, it's sexy. I've heard, so some of my friends have actually caught those sack wing bats like during their research. And they say it's like, you want to like vomit because the smell is so bad. Like mm. <laughs> So there you go, there's a fun bat fact. <laughs> Who acts body spray, yes, I agree, way too much, yep very similar but thank you natty science for the raid that's uh, appreciated that's awesome thanks for stopping by i hope you had a good stream 
any questions, we are here with uh, Dr. Kristen Lear, bat expert. Ask her all questions. Bats. <laughs> bats, bats, bats. Did you know it's bat week? Bat week. Everyone it's best week of the week. year. Yeah. So I've been telling everybody it's bat week. Awesome. I think most people don't, well, I think it's getting more traction, but I think we should definitely share far and wide because bat week is so cool. Hashtag bat week. It is a hashtag, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yes, it is. I mean, there's a week for everything, multiple weeks. There is. But bat week is objectively the best. What's your creepiest bat story? I just saw that. Ooh. I'm sorry if I missed any questions. The chat's been going like pretty nuts now, but uh, I saw that one. Let me. Um, am I able to share my screen at all? Do you know if that's. Yes, possible? you can do that in OBS Ninja. Okay, let me. Okay, let me pull something up real quick. It's my creepiest bat story. Hopefully, I can share this. Um, okay, let me share my screen. And then I have to import the. How uh, do I do this? So if you're in OBS, if you go down to where it says create a secondary stream. Yep. Okay. Um, I believe that's how you do it. Okay. Select a screen to share. Mm, it's not letting me do anything. Oh, wait, there we go. Okay. Entire screen. Okay. Just waiting. <laughs> I had another guest try to get it to work, and, and he couldn't get it to work. But okay. I've had someone else work, use it, and it did work. So, okay. oh, there it goes. How about now? Nice. Can you see it? Yep. Just let me add it. Okay. So this is a bat that I I was in a cave in Australia after college, and we were crawling along in the cave, and all of a sudden I look up, and there's this bat skeleton that's completely skeletonized and kind of mummified, still hanging from the cave wall. Um, so definitely this, this is one of the kind of the creepiest things. Like it's so cool, but I mean, you can see the scapula and the backbone um, and the, the legs. And the cool thing about bats is that they don't have to exert any energy to hold on to hang. Um, they actually have a special tendon in their foot and their ankle that locks into place when they're hanging. And so that's why you can still find like bat mummies still hanging from the wall, like a long time after they've died. Um, so yeah, I think that's my, my creepiest bat encounter. That's horrifying. <laughs> but cool, right? <laughs> it's like something you'd see in Diablo. <laughs> it is. I think it would be even more creepy if it started moving. That would be, I would say. Yes. But it was dead. Thank goodness. You would turn tail and run. Yes, I would. So anyway, that's my that's my uh, my cool thing. Okay, I stopped sharing. I don't know if it, there we go. Okay. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so Natty Science, you just combined like two of the other stories people had, or you you were asleep and a bat landed on your stomach and you had to get a gravy shot, but. Yeah. And again, like, you know, it's, it's very unlikely the bat had rabies. It's, um, you know, a bats can find their way into houses. Like they can get lost when they like go through a crack in your house and get into your room. You're like, oops, um, they don't want to be there. But again, because rabies is so serious, it's always good to be, um, safe, right. Be on the safe side by getting the shots. Yep. Well, that was, that picture was uh, Halloween worthy for sure. Yes, it was. That's what nightmares are made of. Thank well, you. I, I know it is late, isn't it? You might go to bed. Now, now I can't go to sleep for another hour. So <laughs> we have to keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> but your insurance, that's right. You probably didn't have insurance. Cause I don't know. Did you have insurance? Your baby shot? I have insurance. I guess my job covers it now, obviously. But um... There, I had to get some pictures of like friendly, nice bats. <laughs> counteract that oh yeah well, we shouldn't like leave it at just that skeleton <laughs> no, exactly we got it 
we're trying to counteract the scary oh, bat whoops. myth. Whoopsies. We're going for the <laughs> cuddly, friendly bats. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You see, that's a deal, Daddy Science. Only 500 out of 14,000. I'm like, wow. Oh my God. That's terrifying. <laughs> that's scarier than the bat picture. <laughs> Your medical bills, scarier than any horror movie. Uh, You're offering good, good, uh, good, good comments. I like the commentary. <laughs> Well, that was a good question, uh, Volcano Doc. The, what is your creepiest bat story? Very nice. I, What's I one of the projects like you're working on right now? That's a great question. Okay. Oh, the project that I'm working on now. So mm -hmm. um, great question. So at uh, Bat Conservation International, um, I lead our agave restoration initiative. Um, which is where we are restoring agave plants. Remember we talked about with the, the tequila connection and, and um, people using agaves. We're restoring agaves to the Southwest US and Northern Mexico to, um, to provide food for endangered pollinating bats. So I get to, I get to lead that initiative. Um, you know, I get to work with a lot of great partners. We have um, fantastic partners across the US um, in Arizona New Mexico and Texas, and then in northern Mexico, um, just fantastic work. So that's that's what I'm leading now. Does this involve a lot of mist netting of bats? It does not. Um, some some of our collaborators definitely do mist netting um, to catch bats, but most of what I do is we're um, like planting agaves. We actually go out and plant little baby agaves uh, near the bat roosts where we know they're you know the bats are roosting. Um, and we, we do, we do use like infrared cameras, which I think is pretty cool. Um, we can actually like set up the cameras near the agaves when they're in bloom, um, during the summer. And you can actually watch the nectar bats coming, um, to feed on the nectar of the agaves with those cameras. So that's pretty cool. Cool. It's just like a national yeah. geographic special. It really is. It really <laughs> is. Um, they're, and they're really fun to watch cause they're kind of like clumsy when they like go onto the flowers They're not they can't really hover as well as hummingbirds. And so they kind of like throw themselves onto the flowers and you know, drink and then leave. It's pretty fun to watch. Yeah. And actually I have, I, I gave a talk earlier, a virtual talk. So I have a mist net here and I can actually show uh, what a mist net looks like. Um, so this is a mist, it's called a mist net because it kind of like looks like mist, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of like a hairnet, you know, that you see like, I don't know, lunch people wearing. Um, and it's basically so fine, like the, um, the threads are so fine that bats, when they're flying really fast or like hunting an insect, they don't see the mesh in time um, and they fly into it and get tangled in the, in the net. Um, and then, you know, we come along and we take them out very gently and then we do the, you know, weighing them and measuring them um, to see if they're healthy and then we let them go. So, yes, yeah, so that's how we catch bats with mist nets. I have mist netted birds, but never oh, bats. Cool. Birds are, they can be just as like ornery, I think, as bats, but they mm. don't have teeth. Uh, birds don't have like the teeth. And so they, the birds don't chew giant holes in your mist net, whereas the bats, will chew like gigantic holes in your nets, which is so frustrating. <laughs> it's not fun. Birds peck and they have claws. That's true. Bats have claws too, don't they? Mm -hmm. But they're not really that, I feel like they're not as sharp. I don't know, they don't really hurt. It's more the, the teeth when they're biting. We always wear gloves, you know, when we um, mm -hmm. catch bats because we don't want to give anything to the bats. Um, and we change gloves between each bat so we don't, spread that white nose fungus between the bats. Um, but of course the gloves also help protect our fingers from little nips because, you know, the bats are scared and they don't want to be held. So they sometimes try to bite. Lots of good questions. Mm -hmm. Natty's asking about the, uh, if bats can be harmed by coronavirus. We went over that a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. 
the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, or with oh yeah, it's such a big. We actually had to with COVID. We like bat researchers had to stop doing um, hands-on bat research for a while because we didn't know if the bats like here in North America could get COVID. Um, and so there's you know been a lot of like now when we handle bats, we have to wear like we have to wear masks when we handle the bats so we don't breathe on them. Um, you know we have to double glove and because we don't want to give anything to the bats and get them sick. So yeah, we definitely want to be careful. Uh, Quigley is asking about bat guano. Mm -hmm. um, are there guano farms in the US? And what are some of the pros mm -hmm. cons of harvesting guano? So I should, I'm not sure if there's any like uh, established guano farms in the US. Um, there are some sites in the US that have lots of bats that you could collect guano from, um, but I don't know if there's any actual like business. Um, but yeah, around the world, there definitely are um, communities, especially rural communities around the world that will harvest guano from either underneath like trees where lots of bats are roosting, or sometimes the people will go into the caves to collect the guano. And pros and cons, um, pros is that, you know, it's a great fertilizer. You know, guano is great for, for fertilizing plants. Um, and it can very much support local economies, um, you know, local people and their and their livelihoods. The cons is that again, we were talking about, you know, coming in contact with bats. You know, guano is is poop, and it can have some stuff in it. Um, and so, people, if they don't wear the proper like protection, like gloves or masks, could potentially get sick from bat guano, just like they could from you know rodent guano or rodent poop. Um, so yeah, so the cons are that, you know, we want to make sure it's done in a way that won't harm people. And also we want to make sure that it doesn't, the harvest from the caves doesn't disturb the bats themselves, right? Because bats can be pretty sensitive in their caves. And if you're shining lights and you have lots of noise while you're collecting, it can um, force the bats to leave the cave. So yeah, so you can do it in a sustainable way, but um, just making sure you do it in, in that way. Story time. I was in San Salvador, Bahamas, and there was a bat cave on that island. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided to go for a hike, thanks to our wonderful biology professor who thought it would be fun to walk through uh, two feet of bat guano to get in there. Um, <laughs> the shoes afterwards were promptly disposed of. Yeah. Fair warning. Do not wear yeah. shoes <laughs> inside a it's guano stinky, cave. It's right. It's, it's pretty, pretty you crazy. You won't have to dispose of them. <laughs> That's, pretty, that's a cool story. That's pretty neat. Uh, other questions on there. How genetically diverse are bats? Should we think of them as being like different kinds of dogs close together or like birds? Very diverse. Like much, much more like birds. Um, there, it's not like different breeds of dogs. They are completely different species um, and, and super diverse. And I would say even more diverse than birds are to each other. Um, I'm, again, I'm not a genetics or an evolutionary biologist, so um, not my area, but they definitely are very diverse. Um, and there's over 1,400 species of bats currently known around the world. So, you know, that's a lot of different, different bats. It's a good question. Awesome. Is there another? Oh, the Volcano Docs question. Are there any cultures that worship bats? Yeah, so actually in um, a lot of Asian cultures, uh, bats are symbols of good luck. And they bring, if you have um, the symbol of the bat like at your house, it brings good luck and good fortune. Um, so yes, definitely there are bats, or sorry, cultures that worship um, bats or consider them um, you know, good luck. Um, and I wish we could say the same thing you know, here. I wish bats were the good luck charm in the US, but maybe someday. Hmm. Okay. When you saw the bat skeleton in the cave, did you learn how it died? Ooh, I did not. That's a good question. I, you know, I looked at it and I kind of inspected it. Um, I didn't see any obvious like 
broken bones or anything. Um, so I don't know if it was that. Maybe it just died of old age. I mean, they definitely can die of old age, or maybe it was sick. But yeah, I'm not sure. Sorry, I'm reading some of the chat. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> Who's up to try a giveaway? I, I do have some stickers. And there's Ooh, a lot awesome. of people in chat tonight. So I want to try to do a giveaway. And we'll see if it works. What is the cutest bat species? I think that's an opinion. It is an opinion, but oh gosh. I, I would say the flying fox species, like there's multiple flying foxes, but I mean, they literally look like foxes that can fly. Um, and when they're babies, if you just Google um, flying fox baby or pup, I mean, they're, they're adorable. So I, I think they're the cutest, but. I think a lot of people say that. I like. I also like kind of the weirder bats, like the wrinkle-faced bat that has like this really smushed, wrinkly, like crazy-looking face, which isn't traditional like cute, but I think it's pretty cute. <laughs> I see somebody flying fox eating ban eating banana. Yep, mm -hmm. it's a great picture. They like shove their mouth full, and it's adorable. Yep. Uh, Megalomorph asks, besides echolocation, what do bats have any other evolutionary interesting features? Like what are kind of cool adaptations, I guess? Oh, yeah. So obviously hang, hanging upside down is a pretty cool adaptation. Um, you know, bats don't roost like hang or sitting up like birds do. They hang. And so, you know, that's a really cool adaptation to allow them to roost in areas that other animals can't go. Um, you know, so a bat could like be hanging from, from my wall or inside a cave and that kind of helps protect them from predators that can't get into those places. Um, obviously, like you said, echolocation is very, um, very cool adaptation, but their wings are also a cool adaptation. They, they fly with their hands. So, um, if you, yeah, if you look up bat wings, um, you can see that their, their wing is made up of their arm. And then they have the same five finger bones that we have, but their fingers are like super long. Um, and then the, the membrane is stretched between those fingers and the, the arm. Um, so it would be like if we had like three foot long fingers, that's how long our fingers would have to be to be like a bat. Um, but they fly with their, their hands, which is cool. Um, yeah, there's so many, so many cool adaptations. I can keep talking. I'll do one more before the giveaway. Um, the, there's a, uh, several bats in the world, including the bulldog bat that can go fishing. And they actually have these really big like back feet and back toes. And they'll skim, they'll fly and skim over the surface of the water and catch little tiny minnows that are hanging out at the water surface. And they'll scoop the fish into their mouth and then fly to a branch and hang and eat it. So um, I think they're, they're really cool. There's videos on YouTube of um, bulldog bats or you know, fishing bats, and you can see them catching fish. Cool. I mean, bats are so diverse. They're found everywhere. They eat both insects and you know, plant material, you know, pollinators. I mean, so they have to have so many adaptations. Exactly. I mean, there's, there's even carnivorous bats that um, hunt rodents. Um, some bats hunt birds. There's even some bats that hunt and eat smaller bats. Um, so, you know, like, that's pretty cool. There's the vampire bats, the three vampire bat species that eat blood, um, which is a cool adaptation in and of itself. Um, so, yeah, bats are super, super diverse.
So I want to do this giveaway. I got Natty Science is the only one that entered the window sticker. So he's going to end up winning by default if no one else enters. That would just be sad. Not that I'd be happy for him, but as the kids would say, poggers. Yep. You're the goat. Competition. <laughs> <laughs> That's Looks all like I can another say. person. You're goaded. <laughs> Can't it keep up with all the kids. It, <laughs> that's one of those things. If you had said that ten years ago, everyone'd be like, "You're what? What goaded? What does that even mean?" <laughs> I still don't know what it means. <laughs> Greatest of all time. <laughs> oh right. Keep entering in. Dana wants stickers. <laughs> well, make sure it's a singular hat explanation port point sticker. That stickers. I'll get you in. Uh, I don't see how I, I could probably send it outside the US. What it cost? Like maybe a dollar to send a letter? I can do that. I actually have some. Uh, my kids had a um, like a pen pal in Australia. They stopped writing them, so I still have a bunch of stamps. <laughs> so I can probably just shove a bunch of stamps on a letter and get That's it cool. pretty much the other side pal. of the world. <laughs> That's really neat. What, Merch, what do you think this is? A, a partnered station? Just what do you think yeah. it's his volcano doc or something? A, a great channel that has all those stuff. No, if you want a shirt? I'll make you a shirt. I'll take my hand print and I'll just go on the front of a shirt and I'll send it to you. You'll be like, sorry. You'll get your fingerprints, though. I don't know. You better watch out. <laughs> well, yes. I would do that for you. I told my wife she should market the, uh, the little, little crocheted bats and other animals. Oh my gosh, she, sh she definitely should. Like Etsy, there's so much, seriously, there's so much bat stuff and like there's a lot of crazy bat people. So I think she should. Well, what she does do is um, our environmental center ah. does a, like a fall fest and she'll do a basket with a bunch of ones in oh, it. Oh, so. that's fun. That's really cool. Let's go, people. There you go. More people, almost up to 10 people in that giveaway. I want to try this uh, animation and everything. It'll be fun. It'll be excellent. I'm, I'm excited to see the... the uh, I'm excited yeah, to see this, too. I've never seen it before. And I'm the one doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> this is an eventful evening. This is fun. You've never received mail in a traditional way? Oh, my God. That used to be the highlight of, like, I would go to Girl Scout camp in the summer and, um, you know, my parents would send me letters every week. And I, I think, I don't know what I would have done without those letters. You need a letter. Now, we don't get a lot of traditional mail letters. We get a few. That's true. Um, usually it's thank you letters from birthday parties and things like that. Um, what we get a lot of, if you have a teenager in the house that happens to be a junior or senior in their high school year, at least five letters from a college or university every day. Wow. Every day? That's every crazy. day. Man. We'll get this. We'll get stuff from a uni same university three times in the same week. Like They really want you. <laughs> I know. Oh so goodness. if you're ever missing out on mail, just tell someone that you have a teenage kid and get on their mailing list. And all of a sudden, you'll have every university in the U.S. trying to recruit you. That's crazy, man. <laughs> That's a lot of mail. I figured it would be bad, but but it is. There are probably 10 trees worth of uh, <laughs> junk mail we've gotten from these universities. Oh, it's, I feel like they've upped their game since I went, like, was applying to college. Cause, oh, yeah. I mean, I got that in the mail, but not that much. Man, that's You crazy. get a lot. And then when you graduate, they always ask for money. Yep. <laughs> yes. They'll never stop. And they'll never stop. You know what happens? You know, I, well, I liked it when, uh, 
we got stuff for my my oldest she was probably 13 and sally may started sending her stuff <laughs> oh my god like wow okay wow get get those loans now before they're gone i know like, <laughs> no oh my goodness wow i'm still paying off this <laughs> never will be not paying them off someday You never get any letter from colleges. I would complain to your guidance counselor then, because. <laughs> and if you think the mailings are bad, like I've looked at my daughter's email, like she gets like twenty a day from schools recruiting her. Like you think you get a lot of spam mail? No, like you got on the college recruiter list. God. Wow. That's pretty crazy. Uh, I thought I had problems with my email. <laughs> okay, I got one, two, three, four, five, six people in the uh, giveaway. Last call for the giveaway. I right. put in the command right, to get that sticker. do sticker type that in there get in the running a glorious beautiful sign stream sticker and it's kind of a bat i mean it's a dragon right it's I a assume. dragon but, but dragons it, but traditionally have bat wings exactly waiting for anyone else last few and of course if you still have any questions for uh, dr Kristen lear please get them out there because you're running out of time to ask your questions you can always ask her online at bats for life yep yep hit me up and hashtag bat week i know all your information on bats yep definitely check that out <laughs> if you were a bat what breed of bat would you become? Oh, man. He also asked you what your bat costume was for Halloween this year. So, and if you have so, it, you have to go, you have to show it. I do. So, well, let me, okay. So what bat species would I be? I, like I said, I think one of the nectar bat species, the pollinating bats, because I love sugar. I love, you know, candy and baked goods. Um, and they basically eat sugar as their diet. So I think I'd be very happy as a nectar bat. Um, I'll say the Mexican long-nosed bat because that's the one that I work with now in my job. So I'll do that as my bat. And let me show you my my costume. I actually, I had a Girl Scout session with my hometown Girl Scout council today and we made bat wings virtually. Mm -hmm. um, so I got my trash bag bat wings, which are honestly pretty, you know, pretty legit. Let's see if I can spread them out. So I'm a painted bat because the painted bats are the black and orange ones. So got your wing, you got your tail, and you can flap your wings. So and they're easy to make, trash bags and dowel rods and duct tape. Awesome. You are now the yeah. best guest ever because you had <laughs> that costume. Always. <laughs> can you jump off the roof of a building and survive with those? No. Some of the younger girls were like, I'm going to go fly with my wings. And I was like, no, no, don't take no, some no. of that. <laughs> oh, God. who showed you how to do this i want to talk to that woman <laughs> exactly so no no flying with the bat wings unfortunately <sighs> funny <laughs> but those are pretty cool just little uh, dowels and uh big trash bag awesome yeah super do cool. you have a bat hat i do okay one second I'll get my bat. i actually used it Hold on. i think she has a bat everything so my my undergrad advisor in college gave me this when I graduated. It was his parting gift. So let me get it on. There we go. I got my wings. <laughs> so yes, I have a bad hat. And you thought Red Bull would give you wings. Oh, <laughs> it does. Let me tell you. <laughs> Good questions. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Volca Volcano Doc. Uh, 
So what is the biggest threat facing bats at the moment? Last question, Ooh. then we'll do the giveaway. A big question. So worldwide habitat loss, habitat destruction um, is, is kind of the number one thing for bats worldwide. Um, you know, they live in places like trees and caves and, you know, under old buildings and bridges. And, you know, as we develop more and as we have expanded agricultural fields, um, it basically eliminates bat habitat. So, yeah, worldwide habitat loss is, is the leading factor. But um, that's why, you know, that's why we as bat conservationists do what we do. You know, we're trying to restore habitats. We're trying to protect species and we're trying to educate folks about how cool and important bats are. So again, a hopeful note. Hopeful. It's good to end with hope. Yes. Good to end with hope. Go to hashtag bat week. I, I've been, I've been on there. Lots of great information about bats, what bats are, what they're not and how to con, uh, promote bat conservation. Yep. Aqua PFP. Thanks for stopping in. We're just about to do a, uh, a giveaway here. So, uh, Last chance, exclamation point sticker. Get in it. And then I want to try to see if I can actually do a, uh, yes, bats are our friend. Do a yeah. giveaway. Congratulations. Just get into Discord. Yeah, rigged. Yeah. <laughs> get into the Discord, get me your address, and I'll send it right out to you. <laughs> Appreciate you being here. And the raid. Right? You came in and, and gave us a good raid. It's Jordan, bruh. Hey, Jordan. <laughs> Oh, highlighted message from Philip, a story, of course. Uh, wow. I didn't know that about Red Bull, huh? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yes, yes, I had to do that. That was a a thing that happened mainly in Europe, I believe, because I lived there, and it was far bigger there than it was wow. in the U.S. for the longest time. I but guess I can't congratulations, say I'm Natty Science, and congratulations, Bats, on your week. It's bats. And uh, please do all you can to promote how wonderful bats are. We like to, uh, you know, have bats for our Halloween because they can be a little scary and everything. But in truth, bats are here to help. Yeah. Uh, help Thank themselves you. to some nice insects and some nice pollen. Uh, yeah. But they help us in turn pollinating our plants, keeping down pests and just being darn cute. <laughs> so thank you dr kristen Muir, for being here and chatting um yeah, you bet thank you for having me and everyone check her out at bats. bats for life mm -hmm. if you haven't been there yet uh, uh check out her uh her, you're active on twitter so yeah uh, in instagram i'm Spotify. on tiktok i will say i'm not really up to speed with it but i have a tiktok <laughs> you want to check that out Okay. Well, I, and it's I, bats for life, F O R, not the number. So I'm old school that okay. way. Yep. Good. Any last words? Any place else people can find you um, or or connect with you? Yeah, connect on Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. Um, check out Bat Conservation International. Uh, we have a lot of great work and some fun kids activities. If you have kids, um, check that out in the Bat Week website for sure. So those are some great resources. Awesome. Now we are going to raid somebody. Um, Evil Lazi is on. So we all love Evil Lazi here. Uh, he was a guest a few weeks ago. 
It talks about Drosophila research. So as a biology person, you can't go through college without knowing about Drosophila research. That's awesome. <laughs> I remember Bread them. Butter. Um, he just stepped away from his computer. I'm looking at his empty chair on his stream right now. <laughs> but we'll prep to go over there. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, every couple of weeks, we'll be uh, chatting with someone. Our next chat will be in a few weeks in November. And we'll be talking with author Becky Schexer, who writes about education and outdoor education and specific getting kids to do research outside All right I think and going I know on her. expeditions with kids so uh she'll be on november 10th and she is a, a ball of energy i actually know her fun, fun fact what um, you do yes yes yeah um i do so say hi to her for me that's so funny so we, we chat on twitter all the time awesome so uh, I've never actually spoken live to her though. So we've spoken many times via chat, but that's it. So Very that'd cool. be a fun chat. Anyways, uh, evil Lazi, uh, we'll be heading over there. So hang out for a second while we do that raid and congratulations, Natty science. And thank you for that, uh, for that wonderful raid. So let's get this ready. Okay. Awesome, everyone. Thank you for being here and hope you learned something. And let's go say hi to Eva Lazi. Bye, everyone.